We've had 11 that started in uh, 2004, uh, March 2004, and this is the final one in this particular run. And uh, we are so pleased to be hosted by the Dole Institute of Politics for the very last uh, uh, symposium that's part of this particular project. I do want to make a, a couple of announcements here as we're getting ready to start the afternoon session. Uh, please, if you have cell phones, please uh, turn them off or turn them to vibrate so that we don't um, interrupt our speakers as they come up and do their presentations for this afternoon. And uh, I did want to recognize a few folks that have shown up uh, for the afternoon session and uh, sh that did show up uh, late this morning for some of our sessions. And uh, uh, Dr. Linda Sue Warner of the, is the president of Haskell Indian Nations University, and she is joining us this afternoon, along with uh, Denise Loesso, who is actually the Kansas Poet Laureate for the state of Kansas, along with her husband, Tom Wesso. And uh, we also have two tribal chairmen that are joining us this afternoon. Uh, that would be Steve Ortiz of the Bur Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation and Steve Cadu of the Kickapoo Tribe in Kansas. And uh, I also have another announcement to make here. Um, over the lunch we had with our, uh, our dignitaries, our guests, so we had a special uh, flag presentation ceremony by the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation. They, they presented Karen Seberg, who served as the chair of the Kansas Lewis and Clark Bicentennial Commission with one of their tribal flags and that's one, the white one over here posted to my right. Um, they uh, presented Karen with one of those flags to add to the Lewis and Clark uh, Encounter Tribes flag set. And those flags are on display at the back of the hall. If you haven't had a chance to view those flags, please take a, an opportunity to do that during the break. Those particular flag sets uh, started out as 28 from the original. That was the original set that was released for the commemoration of the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. But uh, the Kansas flag set can boast that we have about five flags now that are not in any other collection. Those are the flags that were presented to us, just like the one was presented to us over lunch, to include in that particular flag set. So I think we probably have the largest set of flags of Lewis and Clark Encounter Tribe. So it's a very special thing to have those on display display and, and uh, please take an opportunity to, to view those flags at the break. So I'm going to get off the stage here and turn it over to Jonathan Earle uh, for, for the uh, Dole Institute and uh, he's going to help kick off the afternoon's events. Jonathan? Thanks, Chris. Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, really fantastic morning here at the Dole Institute, one we're so proud to be part of. Um, welcome to the afternoon session of the Kansas Lewis and Clark Symposium at the Dole Institute. As uh, Chris mentioned, I'm Jonathan Earle. I'm Associate Director for Programming here at the Dole Institute, and I'm also a historian of the 19th century United States and a professor in the History Department. So you can imagine how much this meeting means to me and how, pr how proud I am to have it take place here. This morning we learned a lot about the government-to-government -government interactions between the newly minted United States and Indian nations along the trail of, co of the Corps of Discovery and the complex and burdensome history uh, of Native American boarding schools that Dan Wildcat talked about. This afternoon I'm very much looking forward to uh, the talks on language preservation and the portray and portrayal of Indian people in film. But I want to take just a minute or two of your time at the beginning of the afternoon to discuss just how much the view of what actually happened on the expedition between 1804 and 1806 has changed over time. That's what we historians do. We examine change over time. The original view of historians, almost all of whom were white males at the beginning of our profession, was that the Corps of Discovery was a great shining success for the new nation. Lewis and Clark traveled from St. Louis to the Pacific and back, drawing maps, bringing Indian people under American dominion, making scientific discoveries, and becoming the quintessential Western American heroes. Uh, falling well within those, those big myths of American history like the advance of civilization and how the West was won. All of these now completely discredited myths fit nicely within the early historiography of Lewis and Clark. Added to this over the years was a, a little bit of improvement. We started as historians to take more interest in uh, York, a slave that uh, accompanied the expedition, and Sacagawea, who saved the Corps' bacon on numerous occasions, all while having a baby strapped to her back. Um, but still, the dominant view of that old traditional history of Lewis and Clark uh, continued to dominate. Even the National Park Service website, which is phenomenal, still says, by way of introduction, in their search for a water route to the Pacific, Lewis and Clark opened a new window onto the West for the young United States. 
Okay, not, to, not that much to dispute. But what's really changed over time, and what I'm very proud of as a historian, is that as, a, as we got more and more diverse as a profession of historians, and as Indian sources and writings became more prevalent, the realization occurred that, surprise, the core of discovery was discovering not very much at all. What? People had lived in uh, this part of the country for centuries before Lewis and Clark showed up. Uh, really, a lot of these Indian people discovered these um, core of discovery folks entering their own land. Many of these peoples had already made contact with Europeans. Some spoke English pretty well. Others supplemented their native dress with hats and coats they had received from years of trade and, and exchange with Europeans. Um, Lewis and Clark did make a big deal out of discovering prairie dogs and sending one back to Washington so Thomas Jefferson could, could see it too, but the people who lived here knew a lot about prairie dogs. You see, we historians learn about the past from reading primary documents, and boy did Lewis and Clark and Patrick Gass, a younger uh, member of their, their corps, provide us with primary documents. Edited versions of these were rushed into print and are still available today in handsome editions. What we have much less of and what we need more of are the Indian view, Indian voices, Indian stories about the interactions between the agents of the government of the U.S. and the Indians' sovereign leaders. But that is happily changing as well. I'll give one example. Take the famous meeting ceremony developed by Lewis and Clark, where they explained to uh, Indians that they met along the way that tribal land now belonged to the United States, that a man far in the east was their new great father, Thomas Jefferson, that they would receive a peace medal and see a parade with guns and marching that supposedly impressed the more than 50 Native American tribes uh, that came into contact with Lewis and Clark. That's what we know from the white sources. At least that's what they said in their journals. But there was another side to this too. What did this ceremony look like to people on the other side? Gerard Baker, superintendent of the Lewis and Clark National Historical Trail, and Amandan uh, Hitatsa Indian himself, has called Lewis and Clark's Indian diplomacy the great traveling medicine show. I love this image because it turns things on their head. Most Indians probably didn't give much thought to this whole great leader thing, he, he explains. Uh, and most concentrated on how to trade and set up relations with this latest white-skinned power to drop by their homes. Um, as Baker said, you wanted to show Indians uniforms and guns and the objects of the Industrial Revolution to impress them, and then you wanted to show Indians trade goods, and so the great country store was wheeled out, store, and then came the serious negotiation between Lewis and Clark, represented in the traveling medicine show, not only mi met military power, commercial power, but also diplomatic power. I love the way Baker tries to explain the other side of this. More recently, and especially after the widely readable book published by Stephen Ambrose and uh, the Ken Burns film on Lewis and Clark that hewed pretty closely, frankly, to the traditional interpretation I began with, there's been some really critical writing about Lewis and Clark. From a review written by a, a historian named Thomas Slaughter, listen to the change. The Lewis and Clark expedition was a failure by the measure of all goals set for it. Lewis and Clark were neither first nor foremost in the major discoveries for which they claimed credit. They and the men who accompanied them were more human than heroic, less tolerant than offensive, and more rude than diplomatic. In short, they were bellicose, voracious, and indiscriminate purveyors of death throughout the wilderness. And this is a white historian writing about it, so things have surely changed. As you can see, we historians are still wrestling with what this story is about. It is still contested. What everyone still seems to agree on, though, this was an immensely important time, one that gives us a mirror to see many peoples gazing intently on one another and beginning to share a common history. Certainly something to commemorate, if not celebrate. Please enjoy the afternoon symposium. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate that, those words you shared with us. Um, this afternoon, we are going to start off with uh, Dr. Todd Fuller, who is the president of the Pawnee Nation College. And uh, Mr. Fuller has written a book, 60 Feet, 6 Inches, and Other Distances from Home, about the life of Mose Yellow Horse, a professional baseball player that is a Pawnee tribal member. And uh, I'm going to invite Dr. Fuller to come up and get started on his, dis his discussion, his presentation on the preser preservation of indigenous Native American languages. Thank you.
Thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, some of you might know, is a Pawnee tribal member. And as, as uh, fates would have it, um, I am actually married into his family. Um, and so it's a, it is a small world indeed. Um, as Chris was telling you, I uh, wrote a book about uh, a Pawnee tribal member named uh, Mojilla Horse, who was the first full-blood Indian in the major leagues. And as is often the case, what we, what we do, <clears throat> what a lot of people do in Indian country is you, you say how you got where you are. And a poem that I wrote in, uh, in the book, uh, 60 Feet, 6 Inches, and Other Distances from Home, ex helps explain that. And I'd like to start off by reading that, uh, that poem, and of course I'm honored to have the Kansas Poet Laureate here to, to read in front of, and honored to have this opportunity today. It's a poem called Memorizing Oklahoma, a chant in 1992 that includes the word first. And of course, first is a very important word to think about as we consider First Nations, as we consider first contact, and issues like that. These are my first steps into the cemetery, and I'm concentrating on the names chiseled into hundreds of granite stones. None of the ghosts of my relatives has called me here, but I'm captivated by names like Echo Hawk and Lone Chief. I'm wide-eyed by the row of 20 cedars that separates the Indian dead from the white dead. And I will pause at some of the graves to consider the mounted photos of men and women in traditional Pawnee dress. The dead always know when we're looking. They can feel the weight of our bodies above them. And with my first steps into Oklahoma, I'm beginning to wonder if I'll ever find a man named Yellow Horse. I'm starting to wonder if I should retreat to my Toyota, to the road, to Kansas, where it's easy to forget. I could say it was just a Sunday drive. I could tell myself it was just another cemetery. But this is one moment when I begin to hear the soliloquy of a fastball divide the voices of a march wind. This is one time when the moments of my curiosity will not rest, and soon enough I'll sit in front of a stone marked Moe's Yellow Horse and repeat the lines of his epitaph for years to come. And his epitaph read, First full blood Indian in Major League, Pittsburgh Pirates, 1921 22. And soon enough, Palominos will begin charging into my thoughts. I'll give myself the task of memorizing the red seams of a baseball. And I'll begin to dream at all hours of the day in Yellow Horse Technicolor. And with that, I began my journey to Pawnee. I'm from Indiana, uh, was raised there, went to high school there, went, did my undergrad work at Indiana University, and then got to uh, Wichita State. And from Wichita State, uh, where I got an MFA, went to Oklahoma State, where I received my PhD in 1999. And I started working on this, this book on Yellow Horse in, in the early 90s. And that work with, with the tribe led me to, to Pawnee, led me to speak with many tribal elders and others who knew either, either knew Mose directly or knew of him. And so they gave me many stories like that about what he did and who he was as a person. And what happened in, in that, 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 that reciprocation was that I realized as, as a non-Indian scholar as a non-Indian person that I had to do something that was appropriate, an appropriate level of reciprocation, of giving back, because we know too many stories about white scholars who go into Indian country, they take what they need, they do their research, and they send a box of books to the res. And that's the extent of the exchange and the reciprocation. And I just felt like I wasn't going to be one of those guys. Was it going to be somebody who just took, and then what I gave back was a pittance compared to what was given to me in the first place? So, in 2002, as I was looking for a job, there happened to be an opening at the Pawnee Nation. And I applied for it, and the Business Council was gracious enough to let me have this job. 
and then I was there for a couple of years doing different work, building, uh, uh, doing construction projects, of course, doing construction projects. That's what I was hired to do, and they don't teach a lot about construction uh, when you're getting a PhD in English. <laughs> All right, so I was doing a lot of on-the-job training, <clears throat> you might say. And uh, in 2003, uh, the Business Council approached me and they said, you know, we've had this idea about starting a, a tribal college for some time. And I sat and I thought about that and I, you know, talked to, talked to friends, talked to relatives about that and stuff. And I realized that I was supposed to be in Pawnee, back in Pawnee, that it was a homecoming, a returning, that I was actually going to the place I was meant to be to do this work. And that, that first page that you see up there that's projected on that screen, Pawnee Nation College, that's why I was sent back. That's part of the reason why Yellow Horse found me. At least I believe that. I believe that spiritually, that all this works together and, and that there's a plan for these kinds of things. And so in 2003, we started working on uh, Pawnee Nation College and, and getting things like a curriculum development uh, developed in, in, in American Indian Studies and just, just considered all the things that needed to be done to start a college because most, most all of you, unless you, you went to a tribal college, you went to places, you walked indoors like this, okay? The electricity is on, the air is on, the walls are built, the floor is here, the foundation is here, right? The technology is in place. You see the projection there, the PowerPoint. It's there, right? Not when you're talking about tribal colleges. You have to build a tribal college from scratch, from nothing, no money. All you have is an idea and a passion, and that's where it starts. And so we were lucky enough to have a lot of people on business council who understood that and who felt that passion too. Okay, and, and if you were here earlier and you heard Dr. Wildcat's presentation about the beginning of the boarding school era, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon dovetails very nicely as a part two of that. Okay, a lot of what he was talking about was a lot of those, a lot of those negative things, a lot of those bad things that happened. When you talk about the tribal college movement and somebody, excuse me, somebody asked a question about tribal colleges, and whatnot, and it was a perfect dovetail, dovetail to what we're doing in Pawnee, okay? And not just in Pawnee, but all across the country. In fact, I'd venture to ask the crowd, does anybody know how many tribal colleges there are in, in the United States? Anybody venture a guess? 36. 36. 36 that belong to AHEC, right? There are also, tribal, the tribal college movement has also gotten to Oklahoma, finally so that there's Pawnee Nation College. The Comanches have a college in, in Lawton. The uh, Creeks have a college in Okmogee. And the CNAs, the Cheyenne and Arapahoes have a tribal college <clears throat> in Weatherford, okay? So there are four tribal colleges in Oklahoma, so that number is now over 40, or it's reached 40. And we're, of course, happy to, happy to be part of that. And when we started in 2005 at Pawnee Nation College, we had 18 students. 18. What do you think Kansas legislature would do if you had 18 students at the University of Kansas? <laughs> All right. They'd, they'd be shocked, of course. Somebody in marketing isn't doing their job. When we, when we started with those 18 students, we started in classes that included Pawnee language, one, Pawnee language two, Pawnee language three, American, other American Indian Studies courses like Introduction to Sovereignty and Tribal Governments. You see, what the Tribal College movement is, is exactly what Dr. Wildcat talked about earlier, which is their think tanks. They're places where American Indian Studies is a vital component of research, that it matters. American Indian Studies matters because from Indiana, I can tell you, being from Indiana, you go east of the Mississippi, where I grew up, I didn't, I didn't see an Indian until I was 21. I tell my wife that, who's Pawnee, and she's shocked. She doesn't believe me. She doesn't want to believe that story. Oh, it's impossible. But it's true. If you grew up east of the Mississippi, you know that that was the case. Okay? And so what we did 
was we, talk, we, we talked about establishing a tribal college that would just not be for Pawnees, that it would be for all the tribes in that area because we've got eight tribes in the north central Kansas area, the Otos, the Osage, the, uh, the Kaws, the Tonkawas, the Iowas, the Sac and Fox, all these tribes down there, um, all of them who need educational opportunities, okay? And so we decided it needed to be open up to everybody that that this these opportunities needed to to reach everyone who we serve in our population region and the council in passing the resolution to establish the college decided not just indians either okay not just indians all right this is a tribal college and i'm going to talk a little bit about the oppression that happened at Pawnee Nation at, at the Pawnee Nation Indian Boarding School, but that this is a college that needs to be open to everyone because we're in a remote rural part of the country, and not only not only do do Indians face extreme poverty, but but there are others in the region, non-Indians, who face extreme poverty. Okay, the poverty levels of both Indians and non-Indians in Pawnee County is between 74 and 75 percent. Okay, which is devastating to think of that. All right, but it's the truth for both Indians and non-Indians. So the business council said, we're gonna open up this college to everyone because everyone needs these opportunities. Okay, and with that came a slow, slow momentum. All right, establishing a college, as you know, uh, is a very difficult, difficult thing to do, more than you can e ever imagine. And I would venture to guess that, that no, did well. Excuse me. No, I would venture to guess that that with with all this and establishing a tribal college, that that it takes audacity, because you're dealing with survival, you're dealing with resiliency, you're dealing with celebration, and you're dealing with identity. Okay, those are the core issues that you're dealing with. All right, I'm going to go back a little bit and tell you about about uh, what. Pawnee Nation College was. From 1878 until 1958, the BIA ran a boarding school at the Pawnee Agency that the students nicknamed Gravy U. And they nicknamed it Gravy U because of the bland gravy that was served at every meal, and I'm sure that some of you have, have heard this story at other, other boarding schools, that that's, that's what happened. But the kinds of things that occurred at the boarding school included the fact that Indians could not speak their native languages, okay? And the, the other day I met uh, uh, Don Patterson, who's the chair of the Tonkawa tribe, and he told me that he went to uh, Gravy, he went to the Pawnee Indian boarding school uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, and he said that he saw Indian kids who came there from their Indian communities who would say, uh, you know, greet one another in their native languages, say hello, how you doing? And they would end up getting placed into potato sacks and hung on the walls, those kids, all right? True story, and I've heard it from more than one person. Those are the kinds of things that happened at boarding schools. I also heard another story that, that when the kids first came there, they'd line them up on, on a very long walkway, and uh, they would perform tonsillectomies right there on them as well, okay? These are the th kinds of things that happened. These are the policies that the U.S. government uh, allowed to occur, encouraged to occur, all right? Not just the taking away of, of cultural identity, but also physical harm like that, okay? And it's, it's a common refrain. If, if, uh, if you've studied, studied Indian country at all and come across the boarding school era, these things uh, shouldn't be new to you. Um, but even having a familiarity with them doesn't make them any easier to uh, cope with or understand or deal with. All right, and um, you know, I think I think part of what our core mission has been is to not kill the Indian and save the man, but to celebrate everything that is the Indian and celebrate the person, so that they are empowered that way. Okay, and when when uh, the the school was started uh, in 1878, like I said, it was an industrial school. And those were trade schools. Those were Votech schools where students were taught trades like printing, uh, cafeteria operations for, for the women often, uh, other kinds of home ec, uh, 
carpentry, things like that. It's typical trade professions, okay? But there were, there were no Indians who were in court encouraged to pursue law degrees. There were no Indians who were you know, encouraged to pursue uh, medical degrees uh, or other, other degrees with, within uh, you know, the professions. And what happened is that you had a devastation because of all this, because the taking away of the language and, and the identity and, and the disallowment of cultural practices, is that you, a tremendous gap was created a tremendous gap between what the grandparents knew and what the kids knew, all right? From, from one generation to the next, the gap got bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? And then what you had happen, all right, as a result of that, as a reaction against it, in the late 60s, the Navajos established Diné College. In 1968, Diné College was established, and with that, the tribal college movement was established as well. Okay. And since then, there are now 35 other tribal colleges that belong to AHEC, which is the American Indian uh, Higher Education Consortium. But then there are colleges, too, other tribal colleges that are sprouting up uh, in parts of Oklahoma, uh, like, I, like I spoke about just a few minutes ago, so that there are 40 tribal colleges in the United States. And every tribal college takes as its mission to serve the Indian communities in their area, whether it's actually on a reservation, or whether it's it's a it's a you know multi-county region or whatever, okay. And most all of these tribal colleges too seek to serve non-Indian populations, and and they speak seek to serve non-Indian populations for reasons I spoke about as well. Um, but but a little more about the history of of the Pawnee Nation College, as you can see from the slide there. Um, Way back in the late 70s, the, there was a business council, a sitting business council, that wanted to establish a community college on the Pawnee Reservation. And I saw this because I saw some old uh, drawings and schematics that, that had on part of the reservation on the site plan uh, a corner of the reservation that included a community college, which I had no knowledge of when I was doing this uh, studying and research uh, in the early part of this decade. And I was really surprised and happy that the council leaders would have had that foresight in the late 70s to want to do that and, and join the college movement that was going on at that time. Um, of course, the reason it didn't happen is, is an all too familiar refrain that there was a lack of human, uh, human resources as well as financial resources. Okay, uh, that's, that's often the case with many good things that are proposed in Indian country. Uh, ideas get bannered around, well, let's do this, let's try that, uh, but there, there aren't the, either the human resources to carry out the implementation or there's not the money to carry out the implementation. I mean, uh, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's wonderful to stand up here and say tribal college movement and talk about the establishment of the Pawnee Nation College, but if we don't have people on the ground uh, trying to find resources to make this happen, it's, it's just a theory. All right, and, and theories are, are wonderful to discuss in classrooms, but they don't create changes in the world unless people can put them into action. And that's one thing that's been beautiful about the tribal college movement is that what started as a theory over in Navajo land has, did become a movement, so that there are 40 tribal colleges uh, in Oklahoma, or in, in the United States, and of course those in Oklahoma, of which we're one now, and then what happened with, with uh, Pawnee Nation College is that in the, the early 90s, uh, there was a group that proposed the establishment of an IT academy out in Pawnee. And there was a group of very dedicated people who, who worked hard on that, but the, the IT uh, market, everything that was happening with NASDAQ and other things in the economy prevented that from occurring until in 2004, as I said, the, the Business Council approved the charter for what was then Pawnee Nation Academy. In September of 2005, we, uh, we established a, a board of, of trustees and um, the, the current sitting board has changed a little bit, but you can see that uh, from, from the lineup there that we have uh, several uh, Pawnees, uh, five Pawnees, uh, sitting on the board with, with other business leaders and community leaders and uh, a very proud group and a very determined group um, of, of individuals who very much believe 
in, in what we're doing uh, in Pawnee. One thing that every tribal college has to do when it starts is it has to develop academic partners. Okay? Academic partnerships are key for accrediting because most institutions start out as non-accrediting institutions. So you have to have a partner who will allow you to accredit your, your Comp 1 class, your history classes, your, your indigenous language courses like that. So um, we, we have an accrediting partner, Northern Oklahoma College, NOC they're known as, um, who is our accrediting agency. And they've been wonderful to work with for these, these uh, past three years and continue to be a, a wonderful um, partner that way. And you'll also see on there Oklahoma State University, a Big 12 university, University of Oklahoma uh, is partnered with us. And we're currently working on uh, a partnership with the University of Nebraska, which for the Pawnees makes a lot of sense because Nebraska are those traditional homelands of the Pawnees. And I think the leadership in Nebraska is very excited about that possibility uh, of that happening. And then Pawnee Public Schools is also another partner. And th those kinds of public school partnerships are very important too because they, they become feeder schools for the institution. Um, but more importantly, they, they connect one community to another community. And I think that's something that can't be emphasized enough either, that the communities are connected, that they should be connected and working together this way, whether they're Indian and non-Indian or both Indian or whatever the case might be. And you'll see on this slide too, uh, the college's seal there on the right-hand side. Um, now this seal, I think, is very important to the, to the institution. There's a lot of symbolism that's, that's in there. Um, and you'll see that that facade is the uh, facade of the classroom building, uh, which currently houses the BIA. No small irony there. Um, we, we're trying to give them a hint that they're going to have to go soon. Um, but that was the former classroom building. And above the classroom building, you'll see that uh, black Pawnee star. And the black Pawnee star in Pawnee astronomy was symbolic of, of knowledge, which is why that's on the seal. And so we, we think it's important to always put that idea of knowledge there. And then, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, uh, the bottom ring, it's, it might be kind of difficult to read in the, in the slide, but um, the, on the bottom ring, it, it states uh, just above Pawnee, Oklahoma, Chodix see Chodix. And Chodix see Chodix in Pawnee means men of men or people of people, which is also a fairly uh, common refrain. And we liked the irony of having the tribal slogan in our institutional seal that included a facade of a building at Pawnee Industrial School. The levels of irony are hopefully uh, fairly clear uh, with, with all that. Um, and so we, we include those things as a means of, of empowering uh, our students. Um, I'll go through the partnerships here uh, rather quickly. There's, there's not, a lot of not a lot of need to, to go into those, uh, except for NOCs, which is the accrediting partnership. Our academic programs at Pine Nation College include these programs, which are either, have either been implemented or are currently being implemented. Uh, American Indian Studies, uh, Business Administration, Construction Management, and Health and Human Services. These programs weren't uh, picked out of a hat. There was a lot of uh, community outreach that happened, that went on, in order to identify these programs. And uh, invariably, invariably the, the one that always came up with any group that we talked about, whether it was tribal elders or community members from uh, Pawnee or business council or whomever, was American Indian Studies. Always was number one. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that in, in just a second and, and you'll, you'll see why. But then also business administration because I think what many people know is that regardless of how you, how you identify yourself as Indian and how you practice your, your cultural traditions and whatnot, that, bi that business must be understood, that how business works is important because regardless of, of how traditional you might be, if you have to conduct business, you need to know the parameters of doing that. And, and that was a very kind of clear directive that came, fr came from council, the kind of living in two worlds without sacrificing any identity, okay, which was one reason why 
they wanted uh, the business administration program. And then with construction management and technology, um, a lot of individuals who had gone out, tribal members who had gone out at various times and gotten plumbing uh, certifications or electrical certifications and things like that, who, who had let those certifications go for, for various reasons. And so we thought it was important to put a construction management program into place so that students could study those things and get recertified. And then, if they wanted, go to Oklahoma State. That's where our partnership with Oklahoma State comes in because that partnership allows students to get their associate's degree and then go get a bachelor's degree in construction management at, at that institution. And then, of course, the health, human, and public services. Uh, I, the importance of health, of, of traditional knowledge of health uh, within Indian cultures is very important. And, of course, uh, that includes environmental studies and those sorts of things which must be uh, in, in, tribal members must must take the charge on on uh, doing those things. So with American Indian Studies, we have uh, emphasis areas in American Indian languages, artistic studies, cultural studies, and leadership and management. Okay, um, the one that I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about right now is American Indian languages. The component of, of American Indian languages is, is one that is, is very uh, is vital. The urgency of preserving Indian languages cannot be overstated. And we know that. The leadership of the college knows that. Every tribe in Oklahoma knows that. Every Indian nation across the country knows that. And I think all of them have put numerous, numerous resources into doing what they can to create different tribal language programs. And what we're trying to do with our uh, American Indian Languages emphasis is to establish uh, not only an academic program but a training program where uh, students get, get training as teachers, they get training as, as community activists, and they, they get training to, to market how to market and, and learn about the economic uh, difficulties that face that individuals face when they're trying to deal with, with Indian languages. Um, and so what we, what we did in oh, what we did I thought there was a, another one behind there. What we did with, with the teacher training program. We often, we often find that, that with, with associate degrees, what we can do is set up a degree program of 60-some hours, okay, that includes all the gen ed studies. And then we also set up all the courses for the major, which includes anywhere from uh, 21 to 27 hours. Okay? And within the American Indian Languages emphasis, what we did with that, that, that area, uh, the, the courses in the major, is that we decided to go ahead and create a training program that was a one-year training program. Um, we established this in 2006, and I'm very happy to report that in 2007, there were eight students who received training certificates uh, who were from uh, not only Pawnee, but they were from Uchi, they were from Sac and Fox, they were from Osage, and they were from Oto. So it was a very diverse group, uh, tribally speaking. And so that, that program continues to, to move forward. And what, what we were able to do with, with, those, with those folks is they went out, back, they went back to their communities and they were able to get jobs in their language programs or uh, they were able to secure funding to help their language, language programs, okay? And as an administrator, um, you know, I'm, I'm always uh, concerned about the money, um, always concerned about the operations because, like I said earlier, we can have all these big ideas. We can have all this hope. We can have all these theories. We can have all these action plans. We can do all these things. Say these right things, all right? Good things for the youth. 
all right we want to help the youth we want the youth working with the elders we want community programs that are very ina interactive with those different age groups we want elders going into the the elementary grade school and and teaching uh, the Pawnee language classes and things like that and and helping the elders feel like they're a part of this and helping the youth feel like they're learning from their grandparents and their uncles and aunts that way um, but if we if we don't have the money to make that happen then all it is is idea and so the the importance of funding cannot be overstated either all right and of course this brings up an ironic point I have no idea how much the US government spent with with the boarding schools okay I had no idea how much the construction cost to make those schools I have no idea what the transportation costs were to get the kids there what the foods what the food bill was uh, every month I have no idea I can only guess that that given the time period we're dealing with it's it's lots of millions right and now I think about this moment where we are with all these Indian languages in the in, in the state that they're in which is either in d being endangered or being extinct and the fact that now the US government is not spending millions to help preserve Indian language they're spending billions to help preserve Indian languages and I, I can't help but think I have thought this to myself we've had discussions about this I can't help but think if they wouldn't have spent the millions in the first place they wouldn't have to be spending the billions now but we are where we are okay and we're lucky that there are grant writers that there are other educators across the country who are very devoted to this who very much believe in it who most of whom all work underpaid are overworked work long hours okay the reward that they get is seeing students uh, be empowered watch see students in the classroom and that the epiphanies start occurring at the tables okay the lecture the lecture about the importance of sovereignty begins to unfold and a student understands that if he says nawa itari hello friend in Pawnee that he's preserving his identity that he's understanding and connecting to his culture and that with that connection that sovereignty becomes a little more insured and that it cannot be taken away okay and as we move on and as we develop what we want to become of course is an accredited institution just like Haskell just like those other uh, 36 uh, tribal colleges across the country that's what we're doing we're trying to pursue accreditation so that we are awarding our own degrees okay and we're talking now with the Higher Learning Commission. We're talking now with with uh, AHEC um, and representatives from there, and hope that within the next year we can be a candidate for accreditation, which opens us up for lots of funding to do these things. Because our laundry list of things that we want to do is immense. We want to have a radio station that's that's programmed by the students who are taking media design classes, where we hear Pawnee language being broadcast on radio where we hear Osage language programs going on we want to have a media design program that allows us to establish uh, a TV station where students would be doing the same thing with that we want to establish a hospitality and gaming management program so that Indians are the ones doing the instruction to Indian students and Indian employees at the various casinos and resorts that's what we mean by indigenizing higher education and another thing that we're doing is we're reclaiming a campus the agency in Pawnee um, there are 12 buildings that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places and these are this is kind of difficult to tell from this picture this is the old uh, uh, dining hall but these are uh, sandstone buildings uh, and there's there's about eight of them that are on a central campus uh, very very much like if you've been to small colleges uh, anywhere in the country it, it's a campus that's very much like that okay and um, 
what what's happened uh, when we started the the academic side of it the business council was very much like well we also want these buildings to get preserved too because you know these these buildings are part of our history you know and we know the bad things that happened here all right we acknowledge the bad things that happened here but you know what's more powerful than tearing them down is reclaiming them and having Pawnee language taught in them having the Osage language taught in them having having classes in American Indian music studies taught in them all right yeah that's it's a direct affront to the US government and those policies and there's beauty in that metaphor Dan was talking earlier about the beauty of metaphor there's beauty in the in this metaphor it touches on survival it touches on resiliency it touches on celebration of self and community it touches on celebration of identity and that's ultimately what we want for the Indian kids that we're serving is we want them to know their identities we want them to learn these things that can be very uncomfortable things to learn okay but we want them to know them th these things they must learn them and once learning them what they must do is they must take empowerment from the fact that they are who they are and that their people survived that their languages survived if if those whole languages aren't there at least parts of them parts of them are and they must be they must be grasped they must be held they must be taken into the self so that that language when when kids say uh, that they that there are good things that happen because you're uttering that language it means survival it means that the plan didn't work that Pratt didn't quite get all of the objectives achieved now some of the demographic info um, since we opened in the fall of 2005 uh, with those those 18 students um, we've had nearly 400 that we've served at the college in in college level courses as well as training uh, level courses now you know granted still that that's a, that's a small number it's a modest number it's not a great number okay but it's 400 people who were touched in a rural area who took the language classes who took various American Indian studies classes and learned learned more about their cultures that they didn't know previously and you'll see here this is one of the the spaces that we've had renovated that's uh, the former girls dorm we had uh, an open house there in, in late September 2006 a couple years ago <coughs> and you can see these beautiful floors right the beautiful work that was was done on there and you'll see on the left hand side there is a an electronic classroom so that we we're part of the 21st century it's internet ready some of its wireless and heading toward heading toward uh, the wrap up here of course um, we seek to design programs that encourage language and cultural preservation and that's that's not just in the language classes that's not just in the AIS classes that's in construction management classes what does it mean to be uh, you know a Pawnee nurse what is being a Pawnee nurse what does it mean to be uh, an Osage business person what is the traditional knowledge of the Osages tell us about how business was conducted <coughs> those sorts of things that there's an empowerment there okay so that language is part of of every discipline that's studied so that aspects of the culture are part of every every discipline that's studied okay and, and you'll see here in this bottom point the establishment of the teacher training program um, like I said that's that's been a very successful program and, and I think currently right now we have about 18 students that are in that program uh, and again I gave you the list of the number of, of tribes that were uh, a part of a part of that and um, you know we look we look to expand it of course uh, that's that's all about recruiting that's all about getting students in the classroom and becoming energized about who and what they are um, and ultimately what we're trying to do is create viable educational opportunities for for students so that we will fulfill our mission and energize the the economy which is, of course as we all know is is in uh, a very depressed state okay and finally in closing what I'd like to say is is at this political Institute 
that we're at, that we're at I'd like to make a political statement. Um, November is here very shortly, and the, the right to franchise should be exercised by all. Um, I think it's, it's very important that everybody, I hope that the instructors at Haskell, at KU, at other institutions across the country are energizing their students about their right to franchise and their right to vote. And um, with that, I'd like to say, Datu I hope. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fuller. Appreciate your presentation, and we'll give you a few seconds here to collect your thoughts. And uh, any other questions? Do we have any questions from the crowd uh, for uh, Dr. Fuller for this afternoon? Are you ready? Yeah. I noticed the uh, uh, associations with other universities didn't include any from Kansas. Okay. Could you comment on that? Uh, Really, just because of our geographic location, just because we're we're in Oklahoma, that OU has a Native American Studies program, and because Oklahoma State's a half an hour away, uh, and then with Nebraska, it's just that traditional connection with the that the Pawnees have to uh, Nebraska as their traditional homelands. Hi, um, I was doing some reading and stuff about how the Canadian boarding schools for Indians were very much the same way and very abusive and all that. Do you know, are they starting any sort of tribal programs for, you know, college and university levels? There, I, I believe there are, there's one tribal college in Canada that's affiliated with uh, AHEC, and I think there are two others that have been started who are in, in the process, the same process where we're at right now. Um, I, I was uh, born in Canada, and uh, and so I when I moved here, uh, there was a lot more um, um, happening in Congress that was the compromising and so forth. And now um, uh, with this administration, there's been no uh, checks and balances that I can see um, on. Uh, spending for for and they have lined up with business and so forth and so I I I think we're just in a in a real mess right now and uh, um, and how do we get everybody together I mean every, everybody wants uh, a piece of the cake and so forth but uh, um, how do you how do you get business to be responsible and stuff like that and and you know I I look at it from outside America to see see the tremendous problems we have at this point. Yeah, um, I think you're right. I mean, as far as getting businesses in, involved in in the tribal college movement, um, especially in Oklahoma, I, you know, I deal with Oklahoma foundations all the time, and it's just like any other process, it's very slow in building those relationships. Um, uh, you, have to, you have to build solid relationships with people, uh, personal relationships at times with people so that they understand that, excuse me, what you're trying to do is real and that it is legitimate and that there is uh, a much greater good that's going to come out of it. Because, you know, for instance, one student that we had, we had our uh, first uh, commencement this past May, and we had two students in our first graduating class, uh, which is, we were thrilled with, too, right? And then we did a little research and found out that, uh, that uh, the University of Oklahoma's first graduating class was, I think, eight. All right, and and so in, in starting small, that's that's very typical. And in starting the relationships with different foundations and business people, it just takes time. They've got to they've got to believe in you and trust and see the kind of impact that can be created. And what we had with, with one of the graduates was when we asked him what it meant to go to Pawnee Nation College, what what going to the college meant to him. He kind of sat back and reflected for a minute, and he. Then he started talking. He said, "Well, this this is a school that gave me back my dignity." This was a man who was in his late 30s, who had both of his hips replaced uh, because he'd worked in a factory for almost 20 years, and and they had deteriorated to that point. 
and he had really no options uh, as to what he was, was going to do because he couldn't afford to go to Oklahoma State. And so Pawnee Nation College was his best option. And he was one of our first American Indian Studies graduates. And he, he made no bones about it, told us that, gave, us, gave his, his dignity back to him. And so those are the kinds of things that you can tell people, but it's not usually what you tell them right off the bat. You have to build a relationship relationship slowly like that. More questions? He had, a, I think he had a follow-up. You mentioned language in mm -hmm. relation to using and retaining that type of language. Where is that going to, ha how is that going to happen? Well, every, every tribe has had the good fortune, I say ironically, to work with non-Indian linguists. Okay, the, the Pawnees are no different than the Osages, than the Otos, than anybody else in having the, uh, the non-Indian linguist come and save the language like that. And um, what most tribes have done is they've set up their own archives, they've set up their own programs to have teachers that go out in the community. It's very much a community service based kind of thing. And what we're trying to do at the college is actually establish an archive of all those endangered languages in Oklahoma so that there's a perpetual resource that, that starts uh, becoming more and more indigenized as we get teachers go through this program and then start going out and doing research on their own so that so that the language preservation begins to have an indigenous perspective attached to it and ultimately that's that's the goal any other questions we have one in the back two in the back Um, do you feel that there's a lot of skepticism amongst the native community that um, non-natives can uh, attend the Pawnee Nation College, whereas they could, uh, like native people can attend uh, like a full native college at high school? Is there like a lot of skepticism, you know, among the community? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, the population breakdown <coughs> at the college is, is we're 80 percent Indian. So, uh, you know, that, that's going to be a, a demographic number that we hope is, is always there. And we make it very clear to any student who enters, uh, starting from freshman orientation, that, that this is a tribal college and that our business here is this mission, which is to celebrate and serve Indian cultures and Indian nations. So the, the non-Indian students that we've served so far haven't seen any, any discomfort from them at all. They understand. And, and accept it. And I think that's been the case at some of the other tribal colleges, especially up north, uh, in Minnesota, uh, especially where a lot of non-Indians have gone to those tribal colleges and, and uh, felt more at home in those places because they're smaller than the University of Minnesota. And so they feel like they're getting much more personal instruction and it's, it's of high quality. And so I think ultimately that's kind of what I see people being more concerned about is that the quality of the education with, with regard to the faculty and the kind of attention that they get from those instructors. Do you offer online courses? We are in the process of getting our everything set up web-based right now. Um, we are getting an ITV classroom so that we'll be like uh, sending like pa the Pawnee language classes and some of the other American Indian Studies classes around to different campuses who, who want those. Um, but right now we're in the process of getting our web-based courses designed so that we'll be providing instruction in those, those three ways, ITV, web-based, and of course traditional educational as well. So it'll probably be within the next year, maybe year and a half before that's all ready, but we're trying to get the language classes especially, get those Pawnee language classes up uh, as soon as possible. Any other questions? Yes, I'd like to uh, ask an additional question. Um, with uh, with um, with the total United in terms of the total United States, we're supposed to be uh, a, a democratic society. How do you, how do you think that uh, all these groups will uh, focus on the 
democratic aspects. And right now, I think we, we've done away with democracy, and uh, and we don't have any checks and balances anymore. I'm not really sure what your question is. Well, um, um, I guess historically, uh, uh, the Republicans, if you want to get into into uh, politics, have uh, since Reagan have, uh, have pretty well taken over uh, 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 and got in bed with business, and they they have uh, have. Uh, um, um, lost their democratic aspects of, uh, of uh, uh, values that are related to to the total society. Is that help? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. <laughs> not not really a whole lot to extrapolate as as far as that goes, but uh huh, uh -huh I know what you're saying. We have any other questions in the back? My question is, uh, I just wanted to know, uh, is it bad economics why you got non-Indians in a tribal college? Is that the reason why you're taking non-Indians? And if so, when, what year, what year was that that you started um, non-Indians going to the, your tribal college? It was, it was the, the business council and the charter uh, w within the mission. Um, um, hang on. Within the, the mission of the institution, it was the the council who that oh, that set it up that set it up so that within the mission statement, they the council the, the Pawnee Business Council, the supreme governing body of the of the nation, uh, wanted non-Indians to have access to these educational opportunities. Um, it wasn't so much an economic uh, decision as far as, well, let's, let's get non-Indians in here so we can collect tuition and fees, but it was more of an economic decision of, you know, non-Indians non and Pawnee need these educational opportunities because they're suffering, in, uh, in some cases, worse than some of the, the Indians were. And so it was a matter of making the opportunities available to all because all needed and, and still need those opportunities. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, good afternoon. I, I've heard you use the term tribal college movement several times. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could expound a little bit more about what exactly do you define as the tribal college movement? Uh, I'll kind of stick to uh, AHEC's uh, definition of the tribal college movement. It's uh, that movement of, of tribal colleges, uh, most of whom are controlled by Indian nations. I think Haskell is an exception, and a couple of other schools are, are the exception. And having that tribal control uh, as a governing body of, of an institution that also includes a board of regents and trustees, a majority of which are Indians too. And so that, that is what comprises a tri tribal college. And then the movement part of, of the statement uh, is, is really defined as that movement that started with the, uh, the Navajo uh, in the late 60s and gained momentum as there were uh, numerous other tribes, and especially in the Northern Plains, who established institutions of higher learning um, at Ogallala, Lakota, at uh, um, Dole Knife, um, and places you know all over Montana and North Dakota like that. And so it's, it's a movement that continues on to this day and finally includes a number of the Oklahoma tribes like the Pawnees, Comanches, um, the CNAs, and, and the, uh, the, the Creeks. I'd like to have you comment on the ages of your students because I think that uh, it, except it, uh, it, it, it's an example of the effectiveness of uh, community colleges because at one point I think that the traditional college student was a student that just came out of high school and went on to college. 
but I think it, you, you may have found, and I think it's been found that a lot of our students that go back to school, including myself, didn't go back until they were the mid-20s, early 20s, and so, you know, that didn't mean that we were incapable, it just meant that we made up our mind to do it at that point. And I think that one of the things that college to community colleges have done is, is to demystify the concept of college, because I think a lot of people felt that they weren't either prepared or were afraid of failure and thereby didn't try. And by bringing community colleges back you know, on the reservation, it's uh, helped them to identify more closely with this and felt that they were uh, capable of trying or capable of, of uh, entering and finding themselves capable. And so I think that the community colleges have tapped into what I think is an untapped resource of education for people who, who are capable and if given the chance can have been able to prove that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're, you're exactly right with that. I mean, what we've, what we've found um, in one of the, the first classes that we ran, which was a, uh, an Indian lit class, um, we had our age range of students was 17 to 79 and they were all tribal members and then that's exactly I, I think exemplifies exactly you know what your question demonstrates um, that that there is that broad range of people most of whom are just either seeking knowledge or have finally decided that that they want to be committed to their their education a lot of folks in their like you say in their late 20s or early 30s who you know either were in the service or they were doing other things working and then finally decided with the opportunity right there that that they would take that risk you know and take it upon themselves to be committed to you know making their lives better and learning and that that learning is a good thing and that it can it can help your your mind your body and your spirit that way any other questions? I have one more question for uh, Dr. Fuller. You mentioned earlier about building relationships with other foundations. Mm -hmm. uh, what has been your experience uh, in, in those foundations and building those relationships? Who has contributed to the college and, and who would you like to see contribute to the college? And to close out, uh, you want to give your website for any uh, any additional donations from uh, other folks who would like to contribute? Right. Uh, I'll, I'll start with that last point first. <laughs> Uh, Pawnee Nation College is, is our website, and there is a, a link on the website for giving. Uh, Chris, thanks for asking. Um, we'd welcome your donation too. Um, and the what I found, what we found, is that it, it's mostly uh, foundations out of uh, Tulsa, because of that close geographic proximity and the fact that we've started serving students who are from Tulsa. And so they, they feel that connection and that investment in, in the college uh, because Pawnee, strangely enough, is now part of the Tulsa metro area, which, you know, I, right, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's what's happened. So, um, yeah, and, and you can, like I said, you can go to our website and find out more about the degree programs, about especially the language program. There's a link on there for that American Indian Languages program that unpacks that training program uh, for, for everyone to really learn about. If, as, is that uh, Pawnee Nation College located in Pawnee, Oklahoma? Because there used to be a grade school there in Pawnee, Oklahoma in the 30s. Yep. That's, there? that's where it's located. Yeah, it's located on that agency just like a mile east of the town of Pawnee. Oh, all right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for letting me have this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fuller. Appreciated your presentation. We are now at our, our second break, We're our afternoon break. Um, we are on the schedule to go from uh, 2.45 till about 3 o'clock. You actually have about 20 minutes this time, though, for this particular break. We have